Hi, this is Ms. Ellison. Uh, welcome to my next installment of the Read Aloud for Inside Out by Terry Truman. Today, while we read, we are going to be focusing on a new strategy, which asks us to pay attention to backstory to gain new insights into characters. Normally, when we read a story, the events happen in chronological order, meaning event X will happen, then event Y will happen as well. But sometimes, as we're reading, we will find out, hey, event A, maybe event B and C, those things also happened, but they happened before the story started. And then we start to think, okay, how do those events shape or color the events that have already occurred in the story that we've read. It's important that we take some time to really consider how this might affect our characters' motivations for the things that they have already done in the story. Um, the thinking work is important and you should take a couple minutes just to think about it and then jot down what you are thinking about your characters. Again, one thing that we have to make sure we consider is that pausing to jot is very important in our reading. It helps make sure that we are thinking about our reading, which is the most important thing. So taking this time to pause and think about how the backstory affects what we already know about our characters is incredibly important. Let's just look at an example that we already have from the story right now. Already this in this story, what's happened is that Zach was waiting at a coffee shop when it was robbed by two teenage boys. Zach is worried that he's missing his medication because the robbers turn, or excuse me, the robbery is turning into a hostage situation. So the author informs us through Dr. Curtis's notes at the beginning of each chapter about Zach's past and about things that have happened to him before. And it says that Zach has been hospitalized in a mental institution because he was walking around barefoot in the snow and imagining everyone as zombies. So that kind of colors what Zach has already been thinking and feeling as we've been reading. He's worried about missing his medications. Well, I think that that is absolutely reasonable. This backstory is making me think that Zach could have another episode and that everyone, including the robbers, Everyone in this shop is in danger if he doesn't get his meds soon. This is already something that I thought because he seems so agitated, but this kind of is building the suspense. It's making me think, it's, it's giving me some foreshadowing to make me think that this is definitely going to be an issue moving forward. All right, let's go ahead and go back to our book, Chapter 5. It begins again with some notes. It says, Transcript of video taped recording of Zach's first meeting with Dr. Curtis at Clearwater State Hospital at Greenville. Dr. Curtis, you know you're here at Clearwater State Hospital, right? Zach nods. Dr. Curtis, smiling. This is a safe place. Our main job here is to make sure you're safe, okay? Back to the main story. Yeah. I saw Pulp Fiction, Frosty says. I ask, are you guys going to shoot us like they did in that movie? Stormy laughs, but it's a mean laugh, and he says, just you, pal. Frosty gives Stormy a shove and quickly says to me, no, he's just messing with you. We don't want to shoot anybody if we can help it. But like I was saying before, we've got an announcement. So listen up. Frosty pauses for a second until we're all looking at him. Even though I usually can't figure out social cues, I'm guessing by looking at everybody's faces that I should stay quiet again. Frosty says, we're trying to figure out some way to get out of this mess. We can't think of any way yet. We don't want to hurt any of you, but we're not going to go to jail. And right now you're the only thing keeping us from that. So. We're all going to have to just sit tight for a little while until we figure out how we can work out a deal. The skinny suit, who hasn't said a single word until now, suddenly says, It's not fair. His voice is real whiny. Frosty looks at him and says, 
Yeah, but that's how it is. The old lady with the pink purple hair sitting closest to me who smells so nice speaks up. You're going to have to face the music sometime, you know. That's the way it is, too. She sounds real strict and mean. Her voice is old, too. It sounds like a squeaky door. But she smells so nice. I close my eyes and breathe in her scent. If I don't look at her, at all of her wrinkles and stuff, once she stops talking and I just smell her, I imagine that she's a beautiful girl and that Wong Gong, Wong Gong, happy long, long dong, shut up, I say. The old lady looks at me now. She looks pissed. I say to her, I wasn't talking to you, lady. I don't like her much, even if she smells nice. Frosty lifts his hand, the one without a gun, up to his mouth, but I can tell he's grinning. Maybe he doesn't like pissed off old ladies either. I hear a real loud crackle sound. It's coming from the cops outside again. A second later, there's a voice, and it's got a real scratchy sound that comes through a broken stereo speaker. I can't make out what they're saying, but I hear hostage situation. 10-4. Affirmative. It's just like cop movies. Cops and robbers. Robber snobber. Wong gong, wong gong. I'm hearing that a lot more now, and it's not good. I wonder when they're going to get my medication. Frosty and Stormy are looking at the door, listening to all the noise coming from out front. Across the room, I notice a guy who works here at the coffee shop sneaking toward one of the shelves near where he sits. I look where he's moving and I see what he's doing. On the bottom shelf under some white tablecloths is a big knife. I watch the guy slowly reach up toward the handle. Get your hand off that, Stormy yells. The store guy freezes but looks mad too. He just stares at Stormy. Then Stormy says, I mean it. Get your hand away from that knife. He shoves his gun right up against the guy's head. Frosty goes over to them and points his guy at the store his gun at the store guy. Frosty says, What do you think you're doing? With Frosty's gun pointed at the coffee shop guy, Stormy takes his gun away from the guy's head. The coffee shop guy's face is bright red and his lips quiver. He moves his hand off the knife. He looks like he was about to say something, but Blam! The sound in the little room is the loudest thing I've ever heard. That blam goes blam, 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 like an echo through my skull. And then I hear a real high-pitched ringing. The old ladies lift their hands to cover their ears. The fat suit grabs his chest like his heart's going to explode. The skinny suit begins to shake. I think right away about Pulp Fiction. Who's been shot? Stormy almost drops his gun. He stares at it like it's some weird alien thing. Jesus, Joey, Frosty yells at Stormy. I think, who's Joey? Stormy yells back at Frosty. I didn't mean it. It just went off. Just went off, Frosty says. Are you crazy? He looks around at all of us. Is everybody okay? The little girl has wet her pants. Actually, her dress. At first, I wonder if her mom will rub her nose and the pee, but her mother hugs her close, saying, It's all right, Katie. You're all right. Damn, Frosty says. I didn't mean to, Stormy says again. His voice sounds shaky, like he might start crying. He holds the gun down at his side, and his shoulders are droopy. Frosty says to him, It's okay, man. Nobody's hurt. He looks around at all of us and asks again, nobody's hurt, right? Everybody says no, except for the mom and the little girl who don't say anything. Stormy looks at the little girl who peed her dress, then asks the waitress who works at the coffee shop, is there a restroom back here? The waitress girl grabs a waste basket next to where she sits and throws up into it. <sighs> Frosty says, 
The guy who tries to grab the knife put his arm over the girl's shoulder and yells at Frosty, Jerk! Frosty points his gun at the guy and says, You had to be a big hero. Frosty hurries and grabs the big knife off the shelf and throws it out the doorway into the main room of the coffee shop. A phone, sitting on the desk right next to me, rings. I pick it up and say, hello? Frosty yells at me, hang that up! The man on the phone yells, what happened in there? So I answer, the little girl Peter dress. You shot her for that? The voice yells. I answer, no. Hang up, Frosty yells again. That was a gunshot, wasn't it? It just went off, I say. Frosty points his gun at me. The man on the phone asks, you shot her by ask accident? She's not shot. We heard a shot. Then, just then, I see where the bullet from Stormy's gun went. The desk is shot, I say. Who? The desk is shot, right through the drawer. I look at Frosty, and he cocks his gun, pointing it at my head. Listen, son, the cop says, sounding calmer. You need to throw your weapon out and just come out, therefore, come out of there before somebody gets hurt. Wong, gong, gong, wong. Why does he think I have a weapon? How can I throw it out if I don't have it? Throw it out. Throw up. Throw rug. Frosty's coming toward me. Are you still here, son? The voice asked, interrupting my thoughts. I say once more, the desk is shot. I gotta go now. I hang up the phone. Frosty stops and stands there staring at me. I'm wondering whether I should have said, have a nice day before I hang up. But now I notice that everybody is staring and they're all dead quiet. Did you have a nice chat? Frosty asked. I don't know. I was wondering whether I should have said, Frosty interrupts, yelling, what did you think you were doing picking up the phone? I said, it was ringing. Frosty asks, do you really think it was for you? The second he says this, I remember my mom. I look at my watch. It's 3.57. Wow, I say. My mom's waiting for me. I need my medicine. I gotta go now. I start to stand up, but both Frosty and Stormy jerk their guns and point them at me. Frosty says, you're not going anywhere. What's your name? I look at their guns and sit back down. Zachary McDaniel Wasted. Zachary. Frost says, Zach, I say, not wasteoid, okay? Okay, Frosty says, Zach, not wasteoid. You got it. Listen, Zach, if the phone rings again, it's not your mom and it's not for you. So leave it alone, okay? I say, sure, Frosty. I'm sorry. Actually, I'm not really sorry, but people usually stop being mad at me whenever I say it. Frosty says, just don't do it again. Suddenly, there's a loud sound of footsteps running on the roof. Everybody in the room looks up as if we could look through the ceiling. Stormy says to Frosty, cops? Frosty answers, no, Rudolph and Blitzen and Santa too. Of course it's the cops, Christ. The footsteps get louder. Even though I can see that Frosty doesn't want me to say anything more, I can't stop myself. The bad guys with the guns in Pulp Fiction movies shoot a lot of people. Frosty is still looking up at the ceiling, but he says, yeah, they do. They sure do. He keeps looking up, but he asks, have you ever shot anybody, Zach? I shake my head no, but I don't tell him I almost did shoot me. Frosty, still staring at the ceiling, says, I haven't shot anybody either, Zach. He pauses a second and looks around at all of us sitting here. But there's always a first time. Chapter six. We have more notes from Clearwater State Hospital transcript, a videotaped recording of Zach's second session with Dr. Curtis. Dr. Curtis, when a brain works the way yours works, Zach, you can't tell what you feel. 
If I were to tell you that your mom is dead and that the candy machine is out of candy bars, which news would make you sadder? Zack sits very still, glancing around the office, expressionless and without any emotion. Finally, after several moments, Zack responds. Zack. Would they put more candy bars in the machine pretty soon? Frosty and Stormy are in the corner, whispering back and forth again at Zack's gun and arguing. The sound of the cops on the roof is gone now, but there's still lots of cop sounds from outside in the front. I guess even though they said they'd give Frosty and Stormy time to think, the cops aren't going anywhere. I feel a little better since Frosty explained about not shooting anybody. Frosty's a nice guy for an armed robber, I guess. But it's almost four o'clock now. I'm trying hard not to worry about what might happen if I don't take my medicine pretty soon. I'm trying hard not to worry about dirtbag and rat showing up either, which sometimes happens when I'm late with my meds. I'm trying not to worry, but trying not to worry isn't the same as not worrying. Frosty walks over and picks up the waste basket that the girl threw up in. You done with this? He asks. The girl nods. Frosty carries the wastebasket across the room and sets it on the floor in the open doorway. He pushes it so it slides out into the other room of the coffee shop. Now, he turns around and looks at us. He says, I'm not sure how in the hell things got so out of control here. None of you are shot yet, and none of you will be, but you gotta cooperate. No more hero stuff. I look around at everyone while Frosty is talking. The guy who tried to grab the knife is still looking really mad. The two old ladies just stare at the floor. The girl who got sick isn't looking up either, but she stares off into space, like she's in shock or something. Suddenly, I have a terrible feeling about her. She could be a zombie. Her eyes are red and her skin is white and she stares off into space like she's not really here. She could definitely be a zombie. She could be. I'm really going to have to keep an eye on her. Zach, or excuse me, since Frosty got rid of the wastebasket, it doesn't smell like throw up in here anymore, which is good because I hate the smell of barf. The two suits look like they've always looked. Scared Laurel and Hari lookalikes. As I look at everybody, I notice that none of them look at me, and I wonder if I'm invisible right now. People don't like to look at me, so they pretend I'm invisible. You know, maybe I am. I jerk my arm up into the air real fast like I'm raising my hand in class and then pull it down just as fast. Everybody looks at me, then looks away, except for the skinny suit who stares at me with a completely grossed out expression, like he's looking at a worm or toe jam. Then he says, Jesus, and shakes his head. The fat suit says, just ignore him. He's a nutty as a fruitcake. I ask them, do you like maple bars? The fat suit says, shut up, nut job. Frosty says to them, you shut up. The fat suit shuts up. Everybody does. I leave my arm down at my side. I guess I'm not invisible. I guess that's a relief. Kind of. Man, I need my medication. Now I feel the weird feelings. Bad feelings under my skin, like ants are crawling all over me, or like there's some horrible, something horrible swimming in my blood. Wong Gong, Wong Gong, you're a stupid Wong Gong. Maybe I am. I'm starting to feel worse and worse. Chapter 7 Clearwater State Hospital Transcript of Videotaped Recording of Zach's Second Session with Dr. Curtis. Dr. Curtis holds a photo album that Zach seems to recognize. Your mom brought this in. She thought it might help you remember who you are. They look at the photographs in Zach's family album. After a while, Zach starts to cry. That's not me, he says. Not anymore. Back in the coffee shop, the phone rings. This time, I just leave it alone. Frosty picks it up and says, hello? Frosty is quiet for a few minutes. Now he yells, back off, we're working on it. Then he says, uh-huh. 
a couple times, nodding his head. Now he says, I'm 16, why? Frosty listens for a couple minutes, then yells, yeah, right. You'll try us as adult. I have seen that in the newspapers all the time. Hell, last year, a guy wanted to try a nine-year-old as an adult. A couple years ago, I remember somebody said somewhere that they executed a 15-year-old. Frosty, listen Frosty listened again for a while, and now he says, oh, you promise, huh? What's that supposed to mean to me? Will you put it in writing? He hesitates for a few seconds and says, I'll think about it. He listens some more. Now he says, no, really, I mean it. Back off and I'll think about it. Frosty says, okay, a few more times. Yeah, I get it. He hangs up the phone and just stares at the floor. All of us sit and stare at him. Finally, Frosty turns to Stormy and says, the cops say that they won't charge you or us with kidnapping if we let everyone go in the next 10 minutes. They also say they won't charge us as adults, which means that maybe we won't do jail time, or at least not as much. They say they'll charge us as juveniles. I blurt out, like juvenile delinquents? Frosty says, yeah, Zach, just like juvenile delinquents. Real life, kidnapping, gun-toting, coffee shop, robbing, JDs. Shut up, okay? I say, okay. Stormy says to Frosty, 10 minutes? Yeah, Frosty answers. Stormy asks, and they'll put it in writing? Yep, Frosty says. Then he adds, of course, we don't know what that means exactly. They could just tear it up once everybody is free and they've got us, right? I mean, if we ask for a lawyer, how do they know or how do we know they won't just take some cop and hide a gun up his butt and then waltz him in here and blow us away? We don't know any lawyers. Johnny Cochran is probably not available, and Mom sure as hell doesn't know any lawyers. Stormy says, Mom, are the cops going to tell Mom? Frosty sighs and says to Stormy, Yeah, I'm sure they will once they get us. I mean, come on, think about it. I don't want them to tell Mom, Stormy answers. He looks again like he might start to cry, then says, She'll blame herself. Yeah, I know, Frosty says, but we can't do anything about that now. This whole thing is one dumb, I dumb, dumb, dumb idea. Frosty says, she's too sick. She's, just don't think about it, okay? Frosty interrupts. We'll figure it out later. Right now, we got to find some way to get out of this. Stormy nods, but I think he's still upset because he keeps staring at the floor and won't look up. The skinny suit says, my brother-in-law is a lawyer. Frankie looks at him and says, good, good for him. How's that help us? The skinny suit says, maybe he'd come down and witness the agreement, you know, make sure the police do what they're supposed to do. Frankie thinks about this for a few seconds and asks, what kind of lawyer is he? Skinny says he does probate and estate planning, you know, so that when you pass away all your relatives can inherit your property while minimizing their tax burden and frankie yells we don't need any help making a will we're not dead yet skinny shuts up the phone rings again frosty snatches it up real quick listen jerk he yells we're talking about what we're gonna do we're he suddenly stops his face turns real red i'm sorry he says, no, ma'am. His voice sounds different. Quiet now. No, ma'am. He's fine. Honest. I'm sorry, he says then. Yes, he's, he's right here. The next thing, Frosty turns to me. He puts his hand over the phone and whispers, sorry, Zach. He sounds like he's just had a bad spanking. It's your mom. Okay, we're going to pause in our reading there for today. We're not going to continue on, but we are going to think about how the backstory that we just learned about is going to help us get some new insight into our characters. Of the events that have happened so far, the first one is that Frosty and Stormy, who's really named Joey, attempt to rob a coffee shop. 
Someone outside alerts the police and they end up taking everyone hostage. We also know that the boys claim that they do not want to hurt anyone, and then they both seem really worried and upset when the gun accidentally goes off. At the very end of that chapter, we found out that the boy's mother is sick, and they are worried that she will blame herself for this robbery attempt. That kind of colors what I think about what's happened so far. At the beginning of the story, I might have been thinking that they are just sort of criminals, that they're doing this uh, for some reason. Maybe they want to get some money. Maybe they want to buy some things. Maybe they think it would be cool. I have no idea why they're doing it. But now, now that I know their mom is sick and that they're worried about her blaming herself for what they're doing, I'm thinking that they are they just wanted to do something to try and help their mom. I don't know why. I don't know how this would help. You know, obviously, maybe she needs some money. I don't know. But it makes me feel differently about these two characters. I, I'm more concerned for them. I care more about them because of what we've just read. All right. So before we read this chapter, or at the end of last chapter, I had made a prediction. I said, I predict that this is going to go on long enough that Zach is going to miss his medications and that he will start to see more hallucinations. I believe this because Zach twice thought to himself that when he takes his medication on time, he is okay. After reading, at this point, we know that he is late by about a half hour to take his meds. So that part was correct. He hasn't really seemed to be having any more hallucinations yet, but he does say that his, or thinks that his skin is feeling weird, like bugs are crawling all over it, or that there is something bad moving around in his blood, which seems like maybe he's starting to get worse. After reading chapter seven, I have a new prediction. I think that Zach's mom has a plan to try and deliver the medicine that Zach needs since the cops are letting her call the coffee shop. I feel like they wouldn't let her call unless they were going to let her try and do something to make the situation better for everyone inside the shop. All right, that is all I have for today. Um, thank you so much for listening. Until next time, have a great day.